Hey guys, my name's Andre, coming at you from PacServe Australia. Here to give you a quick rundown on the PFM3. This is our benchtop semi-automatic uh, liquid filler. So you can fill any kind of product ranging from water all the way up to honey and everything in between. So oils, ointments, lotions and potions. Uh, you can dose it out with a single shot anywhere from 2.5 milliliters up to 1.25 liters uh, with interchangeable wet parts. Um, we can guarantee plus or minus 1% accuracy dose to dose. This is a fully Australian made and Australian manufactured machinery built right here in Sydney. This machine is completely pneumatic so it's able to be used with any kind of dangerous or flammable goods. Generally you can expect anywhere from about 8 to 15 units a minute depending on the viscosity of the product and what the fill size is. Hey guys, Andre here at PacServe Australia. Uh, just going to give you a quick rundown on all the buttons and controls on the PFM3 semi-automatic benchtop filler. At the rear here, uh, we have this red shutoff valve. Uh, we've got two wings here. Once they're in line, uh, that allows air to come through the system. Before I turn it on, I'm going to make sure the system is set to off and run. And my emergency stop is off. Cool. Um, First thing I'll do whenever I turn this machine on is check that the air pressure at the rear of the machine is set between five to six bar. Um, I'm gonna come over here and just run through all the ports and what everything does. At the very back left of the machine, we have these two ports here. This is the PSO nozzle or positive shutoff nozzle. This is used when you have a nozzle that actually has the function to actually close itself off to prevent any excess leaking in between fills and any drips going around your product. The middle ports are for the valve. Uh, generally, we'll be running a rotary valve for this machine. Uh, there are instances where you might have a spool valve if you're doing a hot fill, which is above 60 or 65 degrees. Um, but that's always going to be placed in the same two center ports. On the front, you have the foot switch. This is an optional ex extra, which essentially gives the ability just to have a foot switch that every time you press it, the machine will operate. Uh, just makes it a little more user friendly. Here at the front, we have the fill speed. Uh, so it has variable speed on this machine. The fill speed is how quickly this piston head is going to move forward. Essentially, this dictates how quickly your product is going to enter your container. So if I just flick this on and spin this fill uh, switch completely clockwise, it's going to run really, really slow. And then as I open this up, faster, 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 faster. And then same with the recharge, I can turn it all the way down just to reduce the speed which is actually pulling product into here and then the to increase it up. Generally with the fill speed, uh, what we recommend is you run it as quickly as you can without it causing too much agitation or foaminess of the product because obviously you want to get the most units per minute. In terms of recharge, if you're not using a foot switch, what you're actually going to use a recharge speed for is to determine how much time your operator has to get a container in front of the nozzle every time a fill cycle has completed itself. Otherwise, if you're doing, let's say, honey on a really thick day, a uh, really cold day, it's going to be really thick and slow moving. What will happen is the piston head will move all the way back, and then the honey wouldn't have fully uh, filled the cylinder, and it might caveat inside. And what you'll notice is that when the piston head moves forward, next it'll jump quickly and then slow down once it meets the product. You've got to make sure that your recharge is slow enough that the product completely fills the cylinder before it begins the next cycle. Otherwise, you will get variation in your fill size or volume each time. Uh, you've got the off, off and on button here. Uh, it's the toggle switch. So if I switch this on, the machine will just constantly run backwards and forwards. If you're using a foot switch, you'll have this set to off. 
and every time you initiate the foot switch, that will actually uh, get the machine to operate. Next, we have the emergency stop button. So if I run this, let's say I haven't got my container in place by time, I can hit this, it will turn the machine off, and that way I just try to prevent uh, excess product going on the floor, or you know, in any bad situation, hit the big red button. Uh, every time you engage this, make sure you flick the machine back to off, and then release it. If you try to release it, the emergency stop while the machine's still in on, it will start to operate again, and you might be back where you began. Uh, here we have the adjust and run. Uh, normally when you're running the machine, you'll have it set to run. The adjust button is used because all of our cylinders are variable in terms of volume. So if right now we have a 500 milliliter cylinder in here. We generally say the maximum cylinder size, so 500 mil here, uh, it's accurate down to 10% of that volume. So we will recommend filling anywhere from 50 milliliters up to 500 mil here. To do that, I'll forget to adjust. What you'll notice is that the, uh, this main drive bar is actually going to stop at the front, and that will allow me to open up this spoke on the rear hand wheel or the volume adjustment wheel. And then on top here, I've got 0 through 10, which is essentially 0 to 100% of the cylinder volume. And you've got a little volume adjustment indicator arrow here. So if I bring this all the way into roughly where the 5 line is, and then I tighten this back up, that's theory can give me 50% of the 500 mil. So that's how it's going to be my first setting, which will be around 250 mil theoretically. You still want to check this with a scale or your bottle, depending on how you guys are doing it at home. Um, and then once you've done that, you just flick it back to off and run. And now my drive bar is only going to come back this far. Um, cool. That's a quick rundown of the PFM3, all the buttons uh, that we've got in here. Uh, any other details, have a look at the manual. Hey guys, uh, Andre right here at Paxerb. Just gonna give you a quick rundown on how to operate and use and set up the PFM3 Benchtop Semi-Automatic Filler. Uh, I've already put some product in here, which in this case is just water with some blue dye, so it looks Paxerb blue and fancy. And I've got my air connected, turned on, pressure set to five and a half bar right now. Uh, so first step of what I'm gonna do is I want to make sure that my nozzle height is going to be at an appropriate height for my container. The way to do this is I'm just going to loosen this tri-ferrule clamp here a little bit and this one here a little bit. And essentially it's going to allow me just to angle this down. And what I want is to be able to slide my container in nice and easy. Um, and if there's a tiny little bit of a drip there, I want to have a little bit of clearance. Generally, five mil above the lip of the container is pretty good. So I'll tighten that back up. Cool. Uh, next step, what you want to do is you want to flush the machine. Generally, if you have like a beaker or a bucket where you can just cycle through and you just set this to on and run and let the machine constantly cycle, uh, just to eliminate any air inside the system because this will cause you to have variances in the fill volume uh, from fill to fill. Uh, I've already done that process, so we don't need to worry about it in this situation. Uh, all I'm going to do is put my container in here. I'm going to turn my fill knob clockwise, so it's quite a slow initial fill because I don't want my product splashing everywhere um, and wasting my product. So with that said, emergency is out. I'm going to flick this to on, and then I'm also going to have this set to adjust. This means that the main drive bar will stay static at the front of the machine and will allow me to change the overall volume uh, until I can get exactly what I want to do. So let's just cycle this and see what we look how we're looking in terms of volume. It's nice and slow. I'll probably turn that up a little bit. Cool, so I'm a little bit under here. This is around a 375 mil or gram jar. Um, so I've got a 500 mil cylinder here. On the top of your machine, you'll have a zero to 10 uh, number system here. This is essentially zero to 100% of the fill volume of the cylinder. So as I said, this is a 500 mil cylinder. So if I have this set to 10, I should get about 500 milliliters each dose. Because we're around 375, I'm gonna bring this just back to just below eight. Always better to underfill and then do slow increments uh, to get to exactly where you wanna be. Because again, you just don't wanna overfill because you'll create a bit of a mess. So this time, I'll flick the adjust back to run and have this to off. Now I cycle back, I'm going to flick this back to adjust, so this next cycle, if the volume's still not correct, I can just make a minor adjustment again. So move this into position here, flick it on. Again, a little bit slow, so I can increase the speed by spinning this anti-clockwise. We'll stop there. 
pretty healthy looking level. Uh, once you've got it where you want it to be, always a good idea to have a set of scales nearby, which I conveniently have here. I'll plonk an empty container onto here. Just going to tear this. So around zero grams. Now if I put this container on there, I can say, cool, 249 grams, 250. So now, right now I'm happy with that, so I'll run my next four containers. Um, and then what we're gonna do is just check the weights or volumes to ensure that they're not getting any uh, disparity or variance in between fill cycles. So it's uh, quite slow, so I can just increase the fill speed a little bit. And the recharge speed, if I spin it clockwise, it will slow the recharge down, like so. And if I spin it anti-clockwise, it will speed up. I'm using the recharge to give me enough time to get the next container in position. So I can probably crank that up significantly. And this is the last one, so I'll turn it off. Cool. And then we'll just double check uh, the fill volumes here across these containers. 249, so same as the one before. 251, that is acceptable. And 250. Cool, so well within our uh, plus and minus 1% variance from dose to dose. Um, and that's a quick setup of the PFM3 bench model semi automatic filler. Hey guys, Andre here at Paxerv. Just going to give you a quick rundown of strip down and disassembly of all the wet parts on our PFM3 filler. First thing I'm going to do is make sure they have the air switched off and disconnected. Also, I'm going to make sure that my machine has been flushed and there's no remaining product in there, I've gotten rid of as much as possible. Fortunately for me in this situation, I haven't put any product in this machine. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is just loosen uh, these uh, tri-clover clamps here. I'm gonna do one at a time. I'm gonna make sure that I can get the seal that's gonna be located in between each one. All I'm doing is just twisting this anti-clockwise, then it's just going to come off like that. And I'm gonna have these pieces inside. And everything will just come apart. Nice and easy. Uh, here for my gooseneck head and my nozzle, all I'm going to do is just have this knurled locking here that allows me to pull this apart. And then this will just gently pull out of here. I've just got an O-ring in here. If I want to do a deep clean, I'll just use a blunt object like a flat, uh, special flathead screwdriver where I've taken the edges off to get that out. Uh, this allows us to completely disassemble the machine, uh, just get all the remaining product out of there at the end of the day. Next thing I do is I've got my hopper here. I'm going to take this triclover clamp off as well. Might be a good idea to have someone else help you if uh, you haven't done this before. So I want to be careful if you do have excess product in here. This is generally where you're going to get some leakage out of here. It can be advantageous to have a rag or something stuck in underneath here. Just going to flip this up here, get it out of the way. Uh, take note, I've got this rubber or EPDM seal, uh, triclover seal at the top here. We use that for the inlet or where there's going to be suction in, and we use these Teflon ones where this product is getting pushed out of the system. Next, I'm just going to loosen these wing nuts here. And then I'm going to open up my Perspex cover here. Now I've just got this little uh, T or T piece here that I'll be able to pull out. Just put that off to the side and make sure I don't lose it. Next, I'm just going to hold onto my valve body here, and this rotary actuator will slide the whole way out. And now I'm going to make sure that I'm putting pressure towards together whilst I'm doing this to make sure that this doesn't fall apart because it is just held together. I'm going to balance this up gently like this. Next thing I'm going to do is just gently try to rock this back and forth. Gently, gently. And now I've got my product cylinder and all its parts uh, separated from my rotor, uh, valve body. Uh, inside I have my valve. Uh, generally this can be, it can get stuck or can be a little bit difficult to press out. If your fortune is greased well, you can just push it out with your thumbs, just like that. It's got two O-rings on here. These are BS229. Generally we'll run a Viton. Uh, 75. Uh, if you need to get these out, again, if you use something like a tiny little flathead screwdriver, making sure that you don't gouge out any of the plastic or damage the seal itself. That's probably the easiest way just to get this out just when you need to do a deep clean on the machine. 
Uh, the only other part here is we've just got this suck back pin. Uh, this literally just screws out, so it's counterclockwise, just like that. Uh, here, moving on the product cylinder, I've got the uh, end cap here. This literally will just slide off. Next, I've got my piston rod that's inside. Generally, one of the easiest ways to get this out if you're hard, having a hard time is just put it on the edge of the table and just hold this in place. And then if you just wriggle this up and down, up and down, up and down, and then generally it'll come out quite nicely. And finally, got inside my cylinder barrel and then I've just got this transition plate here. Uh, hopefully you should just be able to slide that back and forth. Again, I've got a couple of O-rings here. If I want to do a really deep clean or check to make sure these haven't been damaged, uh, I'll once again pull these out. Uh, final part, piece of the puzzle here is the piston head itself. You'll see I've got two flat spots here, just on the piston head and then also on the tail end. Uh, if you've got a vise around, really handy to be able to clamp this in the vise and then just use a shifter on the top section. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have one of those right now, so I'm going to try to do that on this table. Nice and easy, no stress. Now this whole thing is just going to screw right out. Then I've got my piston rod. And then I've got the piston end plate. Now I've got my lower support ring, which is the thicker one. And then I've got my glide ring, which is this polyethylene uh, piece of plastic. It's energized by this O-ring here. And then finally I've got this upper support ring, which is the thin one. Uh, Got to make sure everything goes back together. If you want to check over anything, just you'll be looking on the outside of this glide ring, which is actually the only part inside of here that makes contact with the cylinder barrel. And I just wanted to see if there's any deep scores or anything in there which might be allowing air to come back and forth into the system, which could play around with the accuracy of your dosing. Um, all right, now we have the fun task of putting this back together once everything is theoretically been cleaned. So I'll start again with this cylinder and we'll just work our way back. So I've got the piston head here. What I'm going to do is just put this small thin one, which is the upper one, in position here. Then I'll put my O-ring over the top here. Glide ring in position over the top here. You can try and press this down. Sometimes it can be a little bit of a struggle. Uh, so if that happens, just put the lower support ring on top. Your piston end plate here. Then if you can just aim everything up and screw your piston rod in, it will generally clamp everything together. And again, you want to use a couple pair of shifters to tighten this together. Uh, again, really handy if you've got a vice line around. Again, I do not. So I'll just nip this up. Alrighty. Now, if we take a look at this cylinder barrel, you'll see we've got a long chamfer or leading edge on one side. And on the other, we've just got a very sharp, very short 45 degree end. The piston head always has to go in on the end with the long lead end. Uh, if you try going on the other end, you're going to have dramas. So I'm just going to push that in. Generally, I'll be using a food grease, uh, which is just, you know, it's uh, FDA compliant, so it's OK if it mixes with your product when you put it in. And I'll just run that around the edge of here. Uh, we've got that available in our shop. Just going to push this in nice and gentle. Going to put this end cap back on. Just going to make sure that marries up nicely in there. And then here, there's two sizes here. Uh, you've got a bigger size and a smaller size. Obviously, I want to use the size that marries up with my barrel here. Um, bigger size is always going to go into our valve. So I'll just press this down here. Again, guys, whenever you pull this part and put everything to, uh, back together, make sure you put some food grease on every single O-ring before uh, running it. Otherwise, it's going to be a lot more prone to wear and tear. So I'll press that in. Last tip I've got is where you've got the flats on this, I want to have this locating pin uh, in line with this, and I want to have everything coming out at a 45 degree angle from here. So something like this. I can just press that down in position. Got my sock back pin just here. Just screw that in. 
Oh, I've left my valve out, but that is okay. So I'm just going to put this O-ring back on. It's theoretically washed and greased. Now you'll see here there is a notch here and my stuck back pin here. Now if I take this uh, valve in my hand, the one end has a nice little slot here. That slot has to marry up in position with this stuck back pin once it's internal. So it's gonna be looking something like that. So I'll push in like that, make sure this notch is in line with the stuck back pin and at that same end. Gently like that and happy days. Again, marry these two points up so they're in line. Push this in, happy days. So now what I'm going to do, make sure this is still pushed all the way to the end. I'm going to make sure I'm holding this tight together. And you'll see I've got this notch here. That's where this is going to have to go down. And it's always going to be on the outside closest to me, uh, the operator. So I'll gently insert this, just like this. Now I'm going to gently wriggle, press this in. Now I'm going to bring my wing nuts in. But I'm going to make sure that I don't completely tighten them. Uh, they're going to be a little bit loose. The idea is uh, I can hopefully pull the piston rod and I can push this in here just to make it easy to pull. But sometimes I might not be able to do it. So what you'll actually do, a uh, little cheeky way is use a volume adjustment handle. You can actually pull, or push I should say, this all the way up. And you'll see I want to make sure that this, the flaps is going to marry up so this can actually go in. If we get closer, I'm not quite there. Because I've left these wing nuts loose, I can actually spin this barrel and that will actually allow me to marry this up nice and easily. So in we go, fantastic. And then once the holes all marry up, I can have this in and if I just gently push this in, happy days. Now the final part is, I'm gonna tighten up these wing nuts. All the way. And I can close this Perspex cover because we're done inside of here. All right, guys, we've got the gooseneck head here, my nozzle, made sure I put my O-ring back in here, I put food grease on it, just going to press this into position, take my knurled locking ring, just put this around the top, and that's just going to screw down nicely here. Great, put that up to the side. Here I have my gooseneck head. I'm going to take one of these white Teflon tri-clover seals, put this at the front, just lodge that in there, get one of these clamps, just going to drop that over the top, can be, takes a little bit of a knack uh, to get used to putting these on by yourself. Always handy to have someone else assist you, uh, especially if you haven't done this before. Next, take another one of these white Teflon seals, use this at the front for my connect the gooseneck to the gooseneck head. Again, just put this gently here. Make sure that's firm and tight. And then last but not least, I'll take the EPDM triferro seal. We use the rubber ones wherever there's going to be suction, uh, just because if there's any damage to the triferro, it will pull it down and avoid any excess air coming into the system. Just gonna flip this up, put this on top. Generally, when you're using the hopper like this, good to have someone else assist you if you can. Uh, it always makes it a little bit easier. Just gonna hold that in position like that. Open this up. Push that in, just tighten that back up again. This is the rubber one, I can give it a few more cranks because it's a little bit more forgiving. Now guys, we've completely stripped down this machine, taken all the parts apart, theoretically given it a clean, and then we've reassembled and put the whole machine back together. Now we're good to operate again. Hey guys, just gonna give you a quick rundown. Uh, this is what we call the suction or pop test. Essentially it's the quickest and most assured method to test if your cylinder is holding pressure. Uh, this matters because if it's not, it means you're gonna get variance in your fill volume every single time. Uh, essentially I've got everything put together but I don't have any parts attached, just my cylinder and valve body in here. Uh, I'm gonna turn the air on. Essentially what I'm going to do is going to have the machine set to run, emergencies off, and I'm going to flick the off button to on, and then I'm going to flick it straight back to off. It's going to cause the main drive bar to come forward and then go back. Essentially what I'm going to do is put my hands to cover these ports, making sure that I don't stick my fingers in because that's very, very dangerous. And what I want to test is that I have suction only on the top port and not the front port, because essentially the way the machine works, as the piston head moves back, it pulls in product from this top port, and as it moves forward, it pushes it out through the front. 
If I have any suction in the front port, either one of the O-rings inside is damaged or the glider ring could be damaged on the piston head or the suck back ring might uh, be wound out a little bit too far. Uh, here we go. On, flick it back to off, weight till this piston bar is at the front. And then I'm gonna cover both of these strongly. Wait till the machine finishes the cycle. Now it's done, I'm gonna wait a couple of seconds. Essentially, I only wanna feel suction on this top hand here. Now on this front hand, I don't have any suction, which is good. And I still have suction on this top hand, even after I've removed my lower hand here. Now if we listen, we get that nice strong pop noise, which indicates that all the O-rings and everything in here is uh, making a great seal and we've got good suction, which means we don't have any variance in our fill volumes in between cycles. Uh, best to do this every time you strip the machine and put it back together. Hey guys, Andre here at Paxo Australia. Just gonna give you a quick rundown on some of the common issues or faults that we uh, get phone calls from clients with and what the best solution is for those. Uh, we're looking at the PFM3 single head bench top unit here today. Uh, let's get going. So the first point of call is checking that you actually have air supply to the machine. You have the shutoff valve here. Uh, it's got these two little wings. You need those to be in line with the air supply. So I'm just gonna spin this and you'll see on this little rectangle here, we've got SUP, which stands for supply. Now here on this face, you've got a dial, which is the amount of air pressure actually entering the machine. Right now, this is set at between two and four bar. Generally, this needs to be at a minimum of five bar, which is at the 12 o'clock position of the clock. So I'm gonna lift this up and then spin this clockwise. And you're just gonna see that little indicator going up. Got into 12, I'll go just over. Anywhere between five and six bar is where we want. And I'll push that back down. The number two problem that we'll often get with our clients or with the machines is people are saying they can flick it to on, they can flick all the buttons and nothing's actually working on the machine. Always have a look at your emergency stop button. Uh, if you can see there's a little loud locking collar here, you can actually press this and it will pop out. If that is engaged like that, the machine will not operate. So you need to ensure the emergency stop is not engaged. Uh, the third big point you'll get is, if currently we're here right now, I've got it set to run, and then I have it set to on, and the machine's still not doing anything. What you'll actually see is my volume adjustment indicator arrow is past the number 10. If I'm past the 10, the cylinder is engaged, is extended all the way, but the sensor back here isn't actually making contact. So I'm gonna wind this in slowly, and now the machine is able to operate. All right guys, so at that point we've checked that the, well, the machine actually has air supply, we've checked that the air pressure is suitable, the emergency stop isn't engaged, and our rear stop sensor has come all the way and making contact. So now theoretically our machine is operating, which is fantastic. Uh, one of the other common issues that we get with our clients is saying that the fill volume is varying from uh, each time the machine cycles. So one time might be 30 milliliters, one time might be 40 milliliters. Um, there's, an, there's another video we've got out there which is the vacuum pressure test where we're essentially testing to ensure that the valve body and the valve inside and the product cylinder, all the seals and everything inside of this is completely in contact, in, intact. If it's not intact, then air can seep into the system causing that variation in fill. Um, run that test and if you've got strong suction and you're still getting issues, the other thing that's always worth checking is on the back of the machine where we have the volume adjustment handle, what we have here is this little knurled locking ring. And essentially, every time the machine cycles back, uh, this stops the handle from bit, which it can do. So make sure that this is completely engaged and locked up. Otherwise, every time this rams back, you're gonna get a micro movement here. And after you've done 10, 20, 50, 100 units, that can uh, extrapolate out to a larger, larger variance in between when you first start and when you finish. If you're still having dramas with the machine, at this point, it'd probably be a good idea to give our technical team a call on our landline number.